Hello everyone, I'm Marek and here with me is my colleague Jan. We are software engineers from APSA Big Data R&D team in Prague, Czech Republic, and we work, work for uh, APSA. APSA is also known as uh, Barclays Africa. It's an African bank uh, providing its services to 12 African countries. And uh, we, in our Big Data R&D team, we try to uh, find and fill the gaps uh, in the Hadoop ecosystem, especially from the perspective of highly regulated uh, entities or companies like us as a bank. So, so far we open sourced uh, two of our projects. The first one is uh, Abris. It's a simple library for the serialization and deserialization of data in a other format to uh, entities uh, uh, in a Spark structured APIs like data frames or data sets. The second one is Spline. Uh, it's a Linux tracking tool for Apache Spark. And I will, I will touch this tool a little bit in our presentation. So, um, actually, we as a bank, we would like to become like a, a truly uh, data driven uh, institution. So, actually, right now, we have data like uh, distributed, let's say, around and across uh, uh, multiple source systems. And we would like to get it into, into one place and build the data lake and afterwards to perform some data analytics. So right now, so we have the data in, a, the, uh, in, a data, uh, in some source systems. And data, those data sets are in various data formats. So they might be stored in uh, XML files, JSON files, and then I said that those, let's say, data, uh, 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 data formats, let's say, are very often uh, heavily structured and nested. So before we ingest the data into, uh, into our data lake, we would like to clean them and transform them in, into some unified format. So, but to achieve that, we would like to, uh, we would like to perform some array operation. It will, it, it will require such, such, such a transformations. And so let's say, so, since uh, Spark structured APIs is the kind of the, the, the most dominant uh, API that is uh, uh, offered by Spark, uh, we decided to go that way. But we have noticed that Spark structured APIs like uh, data frames, Spark SQL, so, uh, or data sets, uh, offer a really, very, very limited amount of functions to perform transformations over uh, array columns. So actually, uh, we took a look at other alternatives of how to transform heavily nested and structured uh, uh, data sets. So actually, we could use, let's say, uh, lower APIs like RDDs or higher order functions that you can find on data sets or uh, UDFs. Everybody knows UDFs. But unfortunately, we as a uh, highly regulated um, institution, we have to provide a, a lineage to our regulators. So I briefly, briefly tell you what the lineage is. So is it just evidence how the numbers were calculated if you, we provide, let's say, some, uh, some, some regulatory reports to regulators? So, but we, if we use, let's say, RDDs or, or UDFs, we can't, let's say, track the lineage, or the, it's a very big task, because you, usually you have to capture all your logic into some lambda functions. And let's say the lambda functions get compiled into to some piece of bytecode, and that, then it's very difficult to infer the logic back and track the lin, lin, lineage information from it. So actually, with our spine tool, spine lineage tracking tool, we um, decided, let's say, to harvest the lineage information from Spark execution plans. So this is not the way to go. So actually, some of my colleagues have tried to work around this problem. They tried to use, let's say, uh, Spark structure APIs. So they decided, let's say, to, 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 to uh, flatten the, the, the structure first, then perform the, the operations, let's say, with the uh, regular joins, filters, and so on, and I may, I may probably uh, change the schema back to, to be nested. But it turned out that it's very inefficient. So later in this presentation, we will a little bit more elaborate, let's say, what, why it is inefficient, and, and what could be, let's say, um, like uh, other ways how to solve that problem. 
We also tried, let's say, to convert array elements, let's say, to uh, dedicated columns. But it has also the problem that it, uh, it, it uh, caused that uh, Spark logical plan exploded. So, and, and in that, uh, with that approach, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't transform very complex and, 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 uh, and structured schemas, for instance. So actually, we decided to, 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 to solve that problem in a, like a, in a completely different manner. So we decided to, to enhance Spark, implement, let's say, some, some, some basic functions, let's say, to, to, to be able to, uh, to perform some transformations over uh, array columns and uh, build uh, or mimic our custom build of, of Spark. So actually, there are two links uh, to, to our custom version of Spark. So if you are interested, you can go ahead, compile it, and run it. But let's say we don't want to spend effort, let's say, on maintaining, like, let's say, uh, different versions of Spark. So we contributed uh, the, our uh, functions that we developed back to Spark. And after um, we submitted two PRs, uh, to, to merge the functions into uh, the master branch of Apache Spark. The, the Spark uh, maintainers created 33 JIRA tickets to enhance the array and the map API, so they introduced kind of, to introduce, let's say, functions that will perform uh, such operations. And it's very really likely that those functions will, will occur in the, the upcoming uh, Spark version 2.4.0. So actually, there is a link. To, uh, to the kind of the umbrella Jira that kind of covers all the, all the functions. So during this presentation, we are going to present um, some of them. So mainly the functions that have already been, have been merged to, uh, to master. And uh, some of them were developed by us, and some of them by the members of the community. So the first function I'm going to talk about is a uh, concat function. So I'm sure that all of you, you know the concat function. Uh, that it already exists in Spark, but it performs uh, concatenation of strings. So actually, uh, all the, actually the, the, the current versions of Spark uh, just accept the string columns as parameters. But with our PR, we, we enhance the logic. And nowadays, it's, uh, it accepts. Uh, also array columns. So, it, so now, now, nowadays it's uh, able to perform the concatenation of the arrays. So this function also supports uh, type coercion. So actually it means that the function accepts the, 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 the columns of, of a different array types. So for, for the example that you can see on the slide, so we try to concatenate the, the column of uh, 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 array of integers and column of array of, uh, of strings. So actually what the, the function does, it, uh, it uh, converts the array uh, of integers to array of string first, and then it performs the concatenation. So also I would like to mention uh, one important aspect, and it's uh, null handling. So just imagine for now that actually we have the data set only with one row, and we would like to concatenate like a several columns. So if there is any uh, null value for, for, for any column, then the output of the function will be null. On the other hand, if a null is, uh, is like an element of uh, an array that we are concatenating, then it's treated as a, as a regular value, and it will occur in, in, in the result array. So the next function I'm going to talk about is flatten. It's purely a new function, and it performs uh, shallow flattening. So in other words, what shallow, shallow flattening is. So if you have, let's say, column of arrays of arrays of arrays, it removes just one level of nesting. So it actually, if you, if you consider the root LA, ar array, it concatenates its elements. So that's actually what it does. So the, the null handling works, works in, in a similar way as for concat function. So if, if uh, input for the flattening function is null, then the result is null. And if the, the root array contains a null, then the result is also null. So if nulls occurs on any, let's say, lower 
layers of uh, nesting, then they are treated as a, as a regular uh, elements of, of arrays. The next function that already exists in Spark, but works only for strings, is reverse function. So we a a extended the logic to support also uh, array columns. So uh, like let's say with uh, this functionality, you can actually reverse the order of elements within the array. Null handling, there is nothing uh, like a important to mention, so it works uh, in the same way uh, as for the, the functions that I already mentioned. So right now we are getting to 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 to, to the like, kind of the virtual bridge between map uh, uh, columns and array columns. So actually, map entries function, what it does is um, that uh, if you it takes a column as a parameter and returns array of entries, of map entries. And the map uh, entries are represented as a, as a struct. And the first element of the struct is a key, and the second element is a value. Uh, null handling also works uh, like a consistently with the other, other functions. The next function, map from entries, is uh, uh, like an inverse function to the previous one. So actually, the development of this function is currently in progress, but I, 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 I would like to mention it just, just for the sake of completeness. So this function takes uh, array of entries, column of uh, with, uh, array of entries, and returns a map column. So null handling, there is also nothing special about it except one thing. So actually, null keys are not allowed. So if you pass, uh, let's say, if you construct, let's say, some data set with null keys, then it will throw a runtime exception and will, it will stop the execution. So now I will ask uh, Jan to proceed with the presentation, and he will de describe other function that has been developed by other members of the community. OK. Hello, everyone. My, my name is Jan. So I'm going to start with the sequence function. So this is a very simple function. It's similar to, for example, range in Scala. So um, basically, you provide kind of a start and stop parameter, and it generates the sequence in between uh, that range. You can also specify optionally kind of a step parameter, which, uh, which describes on how much you want to kind of step ev at every iteration. And we support uh, multiple types to generate sequences of. So obviously, we support numeric sequences uh, with numeric types. So if you specify the start, for example, 1 and, uh, and being 5, or stop being 5, then you, gener you get an array consisting of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Once you've got that, you know, potentially you could also explode it to convert this into rows and so on. In terms of temporal sequences, we support kind of date, date and timestamp types. And let's assume that I want to create an array with all days, all days between, for example, 1st of January and today. So, so this is at interval of one month or one day, so one day or something like that. So, so this function will do this for us. We also support uh, reverse sequences. So rather than kind of going from the lower value all the way down to the top value, we, we, we can specify that we would go the other way. So if we specify a kind of negative, um, a negative step, it will go from, from back to front. Uh, in terms of temporal sequences, these also, there's quite a good piece of work done around supporting time zones and daylight saving times. So that's quite an important aspect as well. So then we've got uh, two very simple questions, very self-explanatory, array min, array max. Um, so those functions basically take an array column and the, 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 an array column of orderable elements. So it, it is really important that you can actually compare the two elements, obviously, uh, to find out which is smaller, which, in, which is larger. And we, def we, we only return the, the, the smallest one. In terms of the null handling for this function, uh, it's probably also worth mentioning that uh, if, you, if you provide a, an empty array, uh, this function will return null. So just watch out for that. OK. You may have seen sort array function in the functions object. And um, th there's actually a new one called array, array sort. Um, 
and, and there's slight difference in how it treats nulls. So for example, in sort array, you could, you could kind of optionally specify a parameter whether you want to sort in ascending or descending order. If you sort it in ascending, your nulls, null values would actually be prepended to the start of your sequence. If you specify descending, uh, the, the nulls would be appended to the end of your sorted sequence. What array sort does, on the other hand, is it always sorts in an ascending order, and it appends the null values to, to the end. So the next one is array join. And this is basically an equivalent of, uh, if you know, for example, make string in Scala. So at the moment, it only supports arrays of strings and you provide a delimiter or a, a separator, and it generates a string with, with those delimiters in between elements. So for example, if you wanted to inverse your split function when you, where you tokenize the sentence into words, uh, th this is the opposite. You could actually reconstruct the sentence out of, out of the tokens. There's also, also an op optional parameter where you can specify the characters or string which, which are meant to uh, replace null values. Okay, so in terms of the arrays overlap, this is qu quite an interesting one. Uh, so it takes two arrays, and, and, and it determines whether or not at least one of those elements overlap. So if, if those arrays share at least one element. So for example, in the first example, we can see that number two is, is in both of those arrays, and therefore it returns true. Uh, so let me kind of go into the null handling, and this is even more interesting. So if you've got nulls in your arrays, but you've got at least one matching element, it will work as expected and return true. The special case is if there are no matching elements, but you've got matching nulls in the two of your arrays, it will actually return null. Okay, so array position and element add. Um, so I know that there are similar functions implemented already, but these, were, uh, these are kind of specialized to uh, satisfy the SQL standard a bit more. So all of these are one-based indexed, so watch, watch out for it. Um, and basically, both are very simple. So array position takes an array and an element. If the element exists in the array, it returns its one indexed position. If not, it returns zero. Um, element at is the inverse of it, so it takes the array and the index, gives you the element, if, if your index is out of bounds of the array, it actually returns null. And it also works for, for maps, so you can, you can get elements uh, from certain map keys. Array repeat, so again, very simple function. Um, so uh, given an element or just a, a SQL type, and a number of times I want to repeat it, I, I create an, uh, an array of, of those elements repeated. Uh, okay, slice, uh, also one, one based index, uh, and basically this, this, is, uh, this is a function, you might know it, for example, from JavaScript, the splice. Uh, it, it, it creates a sub-array of, of your array. So I can, spe I can specify the array column, I can specify where, where I want to start, how many elements I want to take, and it gives me that, uh, that subset. So there are a lot of functions which are currently being developed. And I'm not going to go into too, too much details. Um, basically, those are functions like distinct, intersect, union. So all of them are quite self-explanatory. Some of them have certain edge cases which you might need to watch out for. But uh, it's probably not very relevant to our presentation. So the really interesting part now is the higher order functions. So this is, this is the part that is extremely critical to what we need to achieve. And at the moment, uh, these functions have not been de developed, and probably most of them are not even maybe being worked on. Right? Yeah, so at, yeah. the moment, at the moment, there are JIRA tickets created for them. That, that there is a little bit of documentation. Um, but we, we still, we're still not 100% sure what the implementation is going to look like. So I'm not going to spend too much time talking about them. Uh, but let me introduce at least transform and filter, for example. So transform is a function which takes, uh, it's basically an equivalent of your uh, map function on Scala collections. So it takes an array and it takes 
some sort of lambda expression. We don't know how exactly it's going to be implemented in Spark SQL. It could be a function, it could be a SQL expression with some sort of lambda, lambda in it. Uh, and then it, it applies that function or that expression to, uh, to every element and it, it, it produces a resulting array out of that. Filter, very simple. So again, take an array, take an expression, this time Boolean, and it will create an array of elements which only satisfy that, 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 that expression. So reduce is uh, same as um, in any other kind of um, functional programming language. So you take your array, you specify kind of combination logic or aggregation logic, and you come up with a single value. Okay, so now I really kind of want to reflect back on what we've presented so far. And I wanna talk about why we think this is so crucial to us and why it's so crucial to the Spark community as well. So Marek already mentioned it, you know, we are building a data lake where the da we want the data to be clean, We've got, we want to have data quality metrics and so on. If our data scientist wants to come and grab the data, build, build a machine learning model, we don't want them to spend uh, two weeks trying to pre-process and clean the data and so on. We would like to, we would like to show them a piece of data which, which is kind of understandable by the whole organi organization. Okay. So um, to do that, we obviously need to take those heterogeneous data sources and data formats and trans translate them into a, sing a single data format, in our case, Spark A, for example, and also kind of translate the language of the data set into something that is understandable by the whole, by the whole organization. So I can't really share much, uh, much details about our implementation and <laughs> about our code. So we have prepared a very simple example where we actually evaluated uh, our implementation of Transform. So we have done our implementation of Transform. It is in one of those uh, branches that, uh, that you've seen on the previous slides. Um, and basically, we created a sample data set of 1,000 rows. So it's a relatively small data set. Each, each of those rows has 100 by 150, sorry, 150 by 150 matrix, uh, which is represented as, an, as a nested array of integers. And we thought that to highlight uh, the, uh, the, the explosion approach and the inefficiency of the explosion approach, uh, we said that we really want to do a very simple transformation on that matrix. So we said, let's actually just square its elements, a very simple operation. So using the explosion approach, and you can actually see that um, uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of stages and a lot of shuffles, potentially. The problem with the explosion is that when you explode your array, apply a transformation which might include a shuffle in it, and then collect it back, grouped by some sort of unique ID, you want to preserve the order of elements in your array, especially as this is being developed as kind of generic tools. So we can't make assumptions about the data and the importance of the ordering. And then obviously if you group by and do an aggregation, you also lose all of the other elements in the data set. So, 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 so we were in this implementation, we're kind of joining it back onto the original and so on. Uh, so using the explosion approach, um, you know, running on my, on, my, on my Mac on four cores, it took around 50 seconds. So 50 seconds for um, transforming a th thousand rows on modern hardware isn't so impressive. Um, so that's when we decided to actually implement and test our own version of the transform method. So it, it is still quite um, primitive, it's not perfect. It lacks stuff like the whole stage code generation which could make it even more effective. Uh, but even as this nice, naive implementation, we managed to get four times speed up on transforming arrays. I, I really need to highlight that this is, this is really running just on a MacBook on small sample of data. Um, we have deployed it on some of our production jobs, and we have noticed up to 30 times speed ups in kind of, kind of cluster deployments. So, so for us, this was massive, because all of a sudden, from running or you know, from transforming couple of million rows data set, not massive, uh, and doing it on 100 executors with half a terabyte of memory, 
all of a sudden we can do it on 21 gig executors, and we can do it in 50 seconds instead of half an hour. So that, that's, that's, that's the level of kind of optimization that we managed to achieve here. So uh, before we wrap up, um, I just, yeah, I, 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 one more thing I wanted to add here was that we really do think that this effort was worth it, and we really do think that uh, it, should be, it should be included in, 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 in the core Spark API. Um, we, have seen, we have seen a lot of questions on how to transform arrays in the community, so I, I, I believe that, there might, that it might be a good use case for some of you guys. So before we wrap up, we want to thank all of the reviewers that helped us get our PRs in. It was an amazing experience. It was actually the first time that we have contributed back to an open source project. And, and yeah, we learned a lot, and it was, uh, we, we hope that we keep contributing. <laughs> okay, that's it, thank you very much. All right, are there any questions? So this is only implemented for uh, arrays? Uh, so or what about the other nested types? So it's, uh, at the moment we focused on arrays and maps. Okay, the second question is, um, what are the inner types inside the array? Can it be any arbitrary type or only? It can be arbitrary, uh, arbitrary uh, Spark SQL type. If yeah. you have a data set of you know, some case class, can you do something yeah. with that? Yeah, so we've, we've, uh, we've tested it on arrays of structs, we've tested it on arrays of primitive types, and we've tested it on nested arrays, so arrays of, of arrays of whatever. What in, about case in, classes, any product? So, so case, case classes, remember that this is Spark SQL. So we are, the, the focus of this work is on extending the data set and data frame API. So everything is in tungsten, everything runs natively through, through the Catalyst optimizer, and you do get all of these speed up and optimizations for free, as well as interoperability with all of the, uh, the, the, with the rest of the Spark ecosystem. Do you have any uh, comments on search and replace? S sorry, I couldn't. Search and replace. Searching? Yeah, through, through the arrays. Search and replace in the function. Search and replace. Hmm? Oh, search and replace. Is there, is there a gyro for it? Replace, search and replace. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. So I, I, I don't think I've seen a gyro like that. Uh, um, but feel free, feel free to submit one. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure there will be somebody in the community who would like to take it on. What is the usually what is the steps involved? If you want to make it. Sorry, what is? So if you want to make this part of uh, Spark as a core functionality, yep. part of Spark 2.4, mm -hmm. how do you approach it? Like, do you? So uh, it it would be more like um, a component of or a functionality in Spark SQL. Uh, not not in the core project as in no, no RDDs, uh, but we have already we have already merged a couple of PRs. So I think we have merged around six or seven PRs by now. And you, you know the process is usual, you kind of um, branch it, do, do your stuff, test it, uh, try to merge it back, and then do a couple of uh, <laughs> review cycles. And uh, you know, the, those are let's say a lot of functions. Let's say if you use let's say data frames, so. If you use, let's say, functions in the data namespace, like uh, SQL.functions, those functions will be there. Once they are there, in a, in a, they get in, into to master, so they'll be, in, hopefully, they'll be in the next release of Spark. Uh, thanks for the talk. So this is very relevant to what I'm trying to do uh, at my workplace. So. Uh, we have a use case where we're trying to combine two arrays mm -hmm. um, and then have a function do that. And for that whole reason, we're trying to, we have to read as an RDD and do an RDD level operation. Mm -hmm. This is very useful for us. So my question here is, if I want to convince my team that this is actually going to work for us, uh, what, what should I do? Should I work with my platform team to have a custom version installed on a small um, cluster? Yeah, so if, if, if you're only looking at uh, functions like Concat, for example, or Flutton, so I think uh, these have already been merged into Spark Master. 
uh, and, and we, we kind of assume that they will come in out in the next release, so 2.4.0, so maybe you, you can either wait for uh, two or three months for that to happen, I think, it's two or three months for the next release, um, or, or you could grab, you could build one of our own custom builds which already includes it. So for example, 2.2.1 is, um, is, is built on top of a stable release. So this is literally 2.2.1, with j just three or four added functions. All right, I think everybody's ready to get to lunch, so let's have one more last round of applause.